Hello, everyone, and welcome to God Talks with Reverend Goodwin. Our guest tonight is the General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ, the Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer. John was a local church pastor, then he served in conference staff, and now he is our General Minister and President. Uh, one of my first memories of John Dorhauer is coming to my first UCC board meeting. Um, and I was nervous and excited about what this will mean and what it will be. Um, and somehow I got seated at the table with John and a number of the other officers of the church. And what struck me is here was this young local church pastor that he had never met. Um, and he did what I think is indicative of who he is as a person. He gave me an extravagant welcome. Not only did he give me an extravagant welcome, but a couple of meetings after that, he chose to pick myself and a number of other clergy under 40 to begin to think about the future of the church. It takes leadership to think about the future, not only beyond what God has called you to do in the immediate, but what God might be calling you to do in the future of what we now call the church. So join me in welcoming our general minister and president, the Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer. Hi, John. Hi, Darrell. It's great to see you. And those were some very kind things to hear about me. Thank you very much. All true. You didn't even have to pay me for it. It was just, <laughs> it's just what it is. Um, thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. There are a lot of people who are excited about um, what you might share. And so I'm going to jump right in. Um, the first question is, I've shared a little bit about you, right? I've talked to your local church pastor, conference staff. Now you're working in the national setting of this church. But I would like you to tell me, how might your son describe you to the people? Your son, who now has an amazing jazz single um, called Gradient, which is number five in jazz stations in Maine. How might he describe John to us? So let's let's start with this. Uh, he's a jazz musician because his his father allowed him to be where his dreams would take him. Um, I, I never put restrictions on my children. Uh, I let them discover their passions and go wherever they would lead. Um, and I would hope that would be one thing that he would say about me. It's uh, it's something that I've chosen as a style of leadership uh, that I'm, I'm also proud of. Um, I love to identify the gifts and talents that people bring and, and coach the best out of them. I love to surround myself with talented, intelligent, witty, creative thinking people and get out of their way and create safe space in which they can flourish um, with the gifts that God has given to them. I think he would also describe described me as not just a devoted and very proud father of all three of his children, but a devoted grandfather as well. Um, I have two beautiful grandchildren through my son and his wife. Um, and it, it is an incredible experience uh, to see a third generation. I knew that watching my grandchildren and holding them would be a matter of great pride for me, what I didn't expect, but I've come to experience is watching my child be a good parent to his child is just as gratifying. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll say is I think John, my jazz musician son living in Chicago would, would say about his father that he learned to love all people wherever they are on their journey through what he experienced from his father. Um, uh, and of that, I might be most proud. Mm. John, I want to, uh, pick out something you said. You said you like to surround yourself with, uh, talent. And I think that creative energy that I think comes from the Holy Spirit in this troubling time we're living in, you are leading what some would describe as one of the most progressive denominations in the world. What do you think are some of the skills and talents it takes to lead in such, I think, an impactful time in our world? Let's start with this, vision. Um, my favorite hymn is Be Thou My Vision. It's not just a beautiful tune, but I love what it suggests theologically, that the emptying of oneself and seeing the world through the eyes of God 
seeing every human being through the eyes of God is the, the most important way to walk on this earth. And when I talk about people with talent, I'm talking about people with vision, people who have the capacity to, to not only bring their talents and their intellect to the, uh, the, the effort, but their vision and to allow the world to open up first through the eyes of God as they discern it. Because in our relationship with the creator, with the sacred, with the divine, we all bring through our lens of experience an articulation of the sacred that only that person can bring and can give. And that ability to discern, to see, to envision and to articulate through your own lens, how God is experienced is so important. So that's, that's one of the first things I look for. The second is the confidence, having articulated that vision of what you see, the confidence to commit to that fully, even in the face of resistance. Mm. And for those who have vision, for those who can see beyond what is to what will be, they're always going to experience, um, especially within an institution, even a progressive denomination like the United Church of Christ, they are always going to experience resistance, a fear of the unknown, an attachment to a security that the present affords and putting all of that at risk. And, and so not just the vision, but the courage to remain committed to that vision in the face of resistance are a couple of the things that I, I think a progressive denomination like ours has to value and look for. So continuing with that vision, what is your personal vision and mission? And I wanna separate a little bit from the great visioning work that the denomination is doing, yeah. but for John, what's your personal vision and mission? Uh, my personal mission in life is to act and speak and behave in ways that engender kindness and compassion from another. And therefore, over a lifetime, to commit to the building of God's shalom, God's vision of a beloved community where, as we say in the United Church of Christ, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Um, that articulation of shalom, that vision of the beloved community, I want to be able to say at the end of my life's journey that what I did um, opened up the pathway, a, 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 a pathway that couldn't have been possible if I hadn't been here um, towards the unfolding of that shalom, of that vision of a beloved community. And that was an intentional choice on my part. I not only grew up in a time where the fact that I was white and heterosexual and male afforded me certain privileges. I grew up in, in a household and in a community and in a culture and an environment where I was taught to believe that that was part of the natural order of things and, and the way to walk in the world as a white male heterosexual. And I had to choose early in my career that that was not going to be the pathway of my choosing, that, that I wanted my life's energy to unfold in such a way that whatever I was afforded belonged to everybody. Mm -hmm. And in those places where I could see uh, that, um, that the injustices of our time, whether that's racism, whether that's sexism, whether that's homophobia, whatever those are, that I would use whatever privilege I have to dismantle that um, and, and to step aside as communities who had been forced into the margins could articulate a pathway to justice and that in an accompaniment model as an ally, I would participate with in the creation of an unfolding. Now, that's a, it, it, it's kind of a long way to get to it, but that is my life's mission. Thanks for sharing that. I, I, the term you used a little bit earlier was resistance. And yeah. I want to know a couple of things. Where in your journey did yeah. that awareness 
about that privilege and the voice you had and how the, I think the need to sort of include more people at the table, where did that come from? And then as a denominational leader, when there are so many denomin denominational leaders who look like you, how have they responded <laughs> to you being at the table saying, we must confront white privilege? I wanna know, <laughs> how has that been for you personally? So I've often asked myself, where did that come from? Um, I wanna say that there were two things that happened to me in my childhood. And once they happened to me, I couldn't reconcile what I was experiencing in terms of lessons being taught to me by my father, by my culture as a white male. And those two things were, um, I was a huge baseball fan growing up and hearing and reading the stories of Jackie Robinson had a profound impact on me as a child. He was, to my recollection, my first hero. And the more I learned about who he was and what he had to endure, the less tolerance I had and the less desire I had to be a part of a culture that would choose me because of my skin color over somebody like a Jackie Robinson. Mm. I didn't want that. The second thing was my first real mentor, not just somebody I read about and had hero worship for, uh, but the first flesh and blood human being that I remember admiring as a young man and wanting to be was Richard Lee. He was my, from fifth grade on, he was my grade school teacher. He was my homeroom teacher. He was my speech teacher. Um, and he was a black man. Um, and when I first began to have those feelings about him, that I wanted to be this man, I didn't I didn't do the translation, he's black, I'm white. But as I matured and the civil rights movement was unfolding and Martin Luther King was assassinated and the, the all of that, the race riots erupted, it wasn't something I could ignore anymore. And it was a purely emotive thing on my part. I didn't want to participate in a system that would that would cause anybody like Mr. Lee to feel less about themselves because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. So early on, those two things at a deeply emotive level, not even at a cognitive level, but at a deeply emotive level, made it impossible for me to reconcile what I was being taught about what it meant to be white with, with what I felt internally I was being asked to contribute to as a human being. In terms of how others in the positions that I hold who are predominantly white men respond to this. There was a time early in my career where this sort of, this commitment cast me as an outsider. Mm. Um, I, I don't feel that way anymore. Enough has shifted in the culture that, that white men, even white men who aren't as vocal and as as actively committed to this as I have been, no longer stand in the way as an impediment or as a resistance to. Most of them want to know more about how they can contribute to race equity and racial justice. And I think it's it would be most unusual to see somebody as the head of communion in a position of power and authority in the church today who was still as blatantly racist as the men of my childhood were. And so uh, there's not as much overt resistance, but I would also say that it's been my experience that even from those who want to be committed to the cause, there is a point at which they can't go that far. And once we get to the talk about reparations, that's usually where the, the conversation starts to stumble a little bit. You said at the beginning of your career, there was resistance. Oh, yeah. And yet 
I'm going to use the word you persisted. On one of my <laughs> first videos, seeing um, you in your role as general minister and president was not only talking about the white privilege curriculum, but how we would be continuing to move forward. And you were making an invitation to other leaders, other faithful folks to challenge themselves and engage in this critical conversation, this sacred conversation about race. Where what in you, what in your history, outside of what you've already shared, made you say, I'm gonna keep going. Yes, there might be resistance. Yes, people might not wanna hear what I'm saying right now before yeah. you were general minister and president and able to, yeah. <laughs> to say that in a different way. Why did you keep going? So I remember early on in my theological studies coming across the writings of two theologians, James Cone, whose book, for my people, which I read in my first year at Eden Theological Seminary, was a game changer for me. And what that book did to me was, was say, it's not enough to have a good heart, it's not enough to have good intentions, you gotta walk the walk. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I was reading uh, the theology, the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I actually would a number of years later get to hear James Cone speak. And the presentation was entitled Theology's Great Sin, Silence in the Face of White Supremacy. And the only reason I bring that up is the very first thing he did in that lecture was quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And, and I had studied these two side by side in those formative years. And the quote that he drew in that lecture was a quote that struck me early on in Dietrich's writings. And it was a simple quote that read, when God calls you, God bids you come and die. Mm. And I knew in that moment, I was convicted by the, the truth of that statement, that if I was going to offer myself as an ordinant to the church and spend my life in service to the gospel, I would not be allowed to calculate how much of another person's justice I would mitigate in order to protect and preserve myself, that it had to be an all-in commitment, and that Dietrich Bonhoeffer allowed himself to be killed for the cause gave even more strength and import to those words. So the writings of James Cone, and in particular his book, For My People, and the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and in particular that quote, um, I knew, I knew that I would not allow myself, I couldn't allow myself to calculate how much, how committed I would be based on how my peers would respond to what they were seeing me do or hearing me say. How has your personal image of God, and maybe it's those first formative images of God, how, ha how has that image shaped some of the theological foundation that has helped you kind of make statements like you just made um, about what kind of commitment you have to have to sort of do this work of the gospel. So there, there are two things about my image of God that have become absolutely formative. And, and this has been an evolution for me. I remember walking into the Rock Church, a Catholic church, when I was still in the Catholic seminary, um, in my early 20s with Kevin Hederman, who was the pastor of the church at the time, and seeing the first black Jesus that I had ever seen before. And I remember being shocked, if not quite honestly offended. And I walked out of that sanctuary asking the question, why? Why did that offend me? And it was the first time it hit me that God and Jesus could be something other than white. So this has been a journey for me. And so I now found my image of God on two primary um, theological claims. The first is that early claim in Genesis that we are created in the image and likeness of God, which means that there's not a single human being's face that I can't look into and fail to see the image of God. Mm. And once I concede that, I can't stop with the notion that God is only white. I, I had to abandon that a long time ago. And I have, and I've wept side by side with my dear friend, Tracy Blackman, as we've traveled around the world 
and seen in predominantly black and brown cultures repeated the image of a white Jesus. It is so endemic around the world. Um, and so founding myself on that primal theological claim that we are created in the image and likeness of God was my first step of overcoming that devotion to the white God and the white Jesus. And the second has nothing to do with how I picture God in terms of anthropomorphizing my image of God. It's the foundational theological claim that God is love. I believe that. Uh, Steve Patterson, who was a New Testament professor at Eden Theological Seminary, who is now in, in Oregon teaching, taught me a long time ago. Um, we always struggle with certain biblical passages that feel inconsistent with what we know to be true about God. And we often refer to them as the bully passages, right? The passages people use to beat other people up. And what Steve gave me was a hermeneutic, a, a way of interpreting off the authenticity of scriptural claims through foundational theological presumptions. And if we begin with the notion that God is love, then we can take that hermeneutical lens to scripture and say anything that does not reveal God to be a God of love cannot be authentic scripture for me. Mm. And once both I started with that theological foundation and was given that sort of theological permission from my New Testament professor to, to sort of reinterpret scripture through that lens, then my experience of God, if not my image of God, all must be consistent with what I know about love. Um, and there's nothing in racism, in homophobia, in sexism, in, in, in patriarchy that feels like love to me. Mm -hmm. And so I had to abandon some of the paradigms that just as a white heterosexual male growing up in America, I was asked to hold on to in order to get to my image of God as I have it today. Mm. Do you think there was a price in abandoning those things? I think in a way it's invited you to so many things and I've heard that even in what you've articulated, but is there a cost when we abandon some of those foundational tenets to walk towards something maybe more bright and vibrant? Uh, I've never grieved over the loss of anything I held in terms of theology or or the image of God. That I've rejoiced at every one of these. Um, and it has only led to not just an expanding of my understanding of who God is and how I relate to the sacred, um, but it's also expanded my heart in ways that I could not have anticipated. Where the grief came was, um, my father died. It'll be, it was uh, in February, it was four years ago. Mm. Um, there was a time when I was taking a journey I couldn't take with my dad, who was a kind, loving human being, but who received some of the evolutionary growth and the pathway that I was on as a distancing from who he was, if not a judgment of who he was. Mm. And one of the prices that that can be paid, and I'm not asking for sympathy here, I'm just saying that one of the prices that white men committed to this can pay is the loss of respect, if not relationship, of, of uh, others, either in the family or the community of origin, who aren't willing to take that journey with you. Mm. And I, I had to learn over time to renegotiate my entire relationship with my father. Um, and not force him onto a journey that wasn't his to take. It, it, if it was, he wasn't choosing to take it, and he had the right to do that. Um, that really was the only thing that I grieved along the way. Um, but my wife Mimi and I made a decision a long time ago we chose as our wedding passage, Joshua 24, 15, choose this day whom you will serve as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And we even had to make that commitment before our marriage. I grew up Catholic. She grew up Lutheran. We would both become UCC. 
And we both grew up with members of our household for whom the abandoning of those roots would sever some ties. Yeah. And we had to know whether or not we were committed enough to each other to do that. And we decided early on that what felt like to both of us, we both felt as a, like we were gifts from God to each other and that we would be willing to spend our life with each other. We both knew that if it meant the loss of some of those previous relationships because they couldn't take this journey with us, we would make that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Is how we articulated it early on in our marriage. Wow, thank you, John. I, I'm thinking about a cisgendered straight white man who's watching this right now. <laughs> and they have the theological and even the Holy Spirit unction to do and walk in some of the ways that you're articulating, but they haven't yet made it to that place where they're willing to sacrifice relationship or they, the scripture hasn't yet been revealed to them in the same way to you and Mimi. What's a word of encouragement that you might say yeah. to them right now as they're listening to you and still thinking, but I don't know if I can do that. Just take the next step. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how small it is, but make sure it's an uncomfortable step and one that you're not sure you're safe taking, but take the next step. And all I can do is give an account for my journey. If I was persuaded that that step was a step taken in response to what the Holy Spirit was asking me to do, then there was never a time when the reward and the joy and, and the the benefit on the other side of that step wasn't worth it. And were there times when I felt unsafe and insecure because of those steps? Absolutely. Do I regret any of them? No. And you can't do it all at once. So just take the next step. And if on the other side of that step, you have found growth and joy and, and reward in traveling with the Holy Spirit, then take another one. Life is a journey. I was going to say, you might have your next book, John. <laughs> Take the next step. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you can be my agent. Yeah, look, I'll write the foreword. <laughs> um, thank you for that. I One of the concepts that I've heard you articulate so often is this concept of God is love. I think you even helped us as a denomination articulate in our vision for ourselves that notion of God is love. Can you share with us a couple of moments in your own spiritual journey where you truly felt definitively the love of God? Yeah. So I've already talked about Mimi, my wife, 36 years uh, next month. Um, I was a committed, not just Catholic, but a committed theologian on the pathway to Roman Catholic priesthood. Had finished eight years in the seminary. In those eight years, what I had begun to experience was an emerging theology that I couldn't reconcile with either canon law or with what the Catholic Church was asking me to, to hold on to theologically big questions about why women couldn't be ordained, about why the communion table was closed only to Catholics and I, on and on and on. And with every question, the response was typically, well, John, these have been the teachings of the church for 2000 years. Who are you to question them? I was, I was invited to finish my studies in Rome and I know what that meant. And you don't say no to an invitation like that, but I did. I was beginning to sense already that what I felt from my early days, my early childhood days as a God of the priesthood wasn't something that I could eventually say yes to. And here's why. That yes would have meant a vow of obedience to a bishop, which would have required me, whether I believed it or not, to tell the members of my church that they had to believe this. Mm. And I just knew that my vow would be meaningless. I was not going to spend the rest of my life forcing people to believe. I really thought, and, and so I left the seminary. I, I left the Catholic seminary and it broke my heart. I thought I'd, 
abandoned my call. I thought I had let God down. Mm. Uh, I'm getting to the part about love. Literally, five days after I left the seminary, after eight years, I read 1 Corinthians 13, the love passage at my brother's wedding at which my wife was serving as the maid of honor. And she tells me in that moment, hearing me read that passage, she fell in love with me. Oh, come on. <laughs> right. Out of nothing but pure Catholic guilt, there was no call in this whatsoever, but feeling guilty about having abandoned my vocation to the priesthood. I also went in those intervening five days to the house of the Mary Knowles in St. Louis, Missouri, where I was living and inquired about becoming uh, a monk in their services. They were thrilled and began what would be a two month process at the end of which I would go to New York, learn the Chinese language and culture and then spend the rest of my life in China as a missionary with the, the Marianists. Wow. Right. So, Mimi falls in love with me. I'm no longer going to the priesthood, but soon to leave for China to become a monk. And I fell in love with her. I didn't ask for it. I didn't see it coming. I, I didn't want it. And I had two months to decide whether or not that love that I now see was God's gift to me would be a gift that I would receive or reject. And my yes to her was as much my yes to what I, I experienced as the call of God on my heart and my life. And in saying yes to her, um, I would be saying yes to what would unfold on the other side of that. And I didn't know. I spent a year as a teacher. I spent two years working with a painting contractor. One Sunday afternoon, I was cooking dinner for her family and her brother walked into the kitchen looked me in the eyes with no polite pre-conversation and said, just because you're no longer Catholic doesn't mean you're no longer called. And so my yes to her really was my yes to the ministry that would unfold on the other side of this gift of love that God had, had brought into my life. And when I said to Mimi later that night, I think I'm called back into the seminary, she didn't hesitate. Remember our wedding verse says, for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. There have been some hard yeses on this journey that we've shared together, including yes to this position I'm now serving in. But our yeses have been yeses that we've shared and have been little more than our response in gratitude to God who has gifted us with the love we share with each other and that the love we share that we know originates in the heart of the one who created us. Wow. Now that's your second book. You, <laughs> how to find your wife, read a scripture, or how to find your, how to find your significant other. Um, I'm thinking about, for some folks who are watching this, even in my own journey, saying no to a particular tradition or journey often is, you can interpret as a death sentence to that call. Um, what yeah, I you, thought it was. Yeah, well, well yes, thank you. But what gave you that, courage to hear Mimi's brother say that to you and not go, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I've abandoned what God said. What yeah. gave you courage? So two things. And one, I don't think it had anything to do with courage. It was a recognition that I felt early on that God had placed something in my heart that I interpreted through my Catholic lens because that was the only lens I had in the fifth grade as a call to the priesthood. Now that my theological and ecclesiological lens had expanded and by that time I was Lutheran, I realized that, it, and it wasn't courage, it was just, this is what your heart has been asking of you since you even thought about as a child what you would do with the rest of your life. It was just an affirmation of that on a pathway that had broadened considerably. Um, and, and so I, I honestly don't think it had anything to do with courage. It, it has a lot to do with faith. And if through your lifetime, your experiences with the sacred 
have taught you to trust her, then it doesn't take courage to say yes to what she's asking you to do. Hmm. It takes a lot more courage to say no and to say in response <laughs> to that call, I think I'll do this on my own. Thank you. Um, well, I think many of us have had the courage to say no. And then later <laughs> I came back saying, wait, wait, wait. Um, I think I do want to hear this. When I said my comment, um, I want to pick up on something you said. Um, I said, you know, a death, it could seemingly be like a death. And then you said, not on my watch. Um, as the general minister and president of the United Church of Christ, um, what do you think um, you personally, but the denomination is doing to welcome those who have felt like, well, if I'm not doing it in this particular box, I can't do it. Yeah. What I love about the United Church of Christ, and I'll, I'll go back to my story and come back to your question. So when her brother said that to me, and Mimi and I began to search then for where this journey would take us, we were living in St. Louis, in the only seminary that we found, she was pregnant with our first child. We didn't want to move the family at that time, was Eden Seminary. I'd never heard of the United Church of Christ. Oh. I was working as a painting with a painting contractor. I had my overhauls on. I was splattered with paint. It was 4.30 in the afternoon. I was sweaty and stinky after a long day. And I walked onto the campus and into the office of the Dean of Admissions, who was David Greenhaw, now their president, soon to retire, and told him my story. When he heard I was Catholic and was interested in coming to the seminary, his first question to me was this. If you come here, John, you have to learn how to question everything. And I thought, I'm home. Where have you been all my life? And my love affair with the United Church of Christ has nothing to do with institutional loyalty. It has everything to do with a way of being church that begins with, when you come here, you got to learn to question everything. And anybody who wants to put you into a box, you have the right, if not the responsibility, to interrogate not only the box they're putting you in, but the one who wants to put you in that box. That's what it means to be the United Church of Christ. No box can contain you. No theological position held by anybody else will define or contain your journey with your sacred. That's how I want to be the church. And I wouldn't be the head of this denomination if it didn't believe that and didn't govern itself and, and live out its way of being in ways that honored that. And certainly as its general minister and president, I will give everything I have to interrogating the boxes and the limits that remain. Um, because those, whatever box you've built is a barrier to somebody else. It's not their barrier to joining the UCC. It's their barrier to that authentic encounter with the sacred that their heart is crying out for. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. It is an invitation to my next question. And I had sort of commented earlier that here I was coming to this first meeting and you were sort of sharing and outlining some of the strategic priorities in which you wanted to move forward. One of which was pulling together a group of clergy under 40 <laughs> to really envision and think about the future of the church. In some ways, I think that was a out of the box, um, sort of a paying attention to tradition and inviting people who maybe historically didn't have a voice at the table to have one. Talk to me about the Holy Spirit conversation you had <laughs> to get a place where you would say, yeah. not only am I going to ask these under 40 clergy to do this, um, and then you actually brought it to the board of directors of the denomination right. and started to move forward yeah. in implementing it. So I, talk to I remember my first meeting with those under 40 groups, and I, I made this promise to them that this would not just be another uh committee or task force that they serve on and turn a report in and we thank you for it. I promised you all that if your vision, if you could articulate your vision, I would take it to my board and my staff and we would rebuild the United Church of Christ through the lens that you create. So in terms of the Holy Spirit journey that got me there, um, after 16 years in the local church, 
Um, I felt a call to ministry in the wider church at a time when we had been for two decades as a church talking about something's changing. We don't know what it is. We don't even know why it is. We don't like it, but we're going to resist it with everything we have. Um, and the institution only rewards people with positions of authority if they prove themselves loyal to the institution. Well, here I was serving in the conference, first as an associate and then for eight years in the Southwest. And I began to interrogate the boxes and limits of not just the United Church of Christ, but of what we would consider predominantly mainline Christianity in America. And it was unfolding within the context of what was at the time referred to as the emergent church. Mm -hmm. And all of the institutional church, with few exceptions, was treating the emergent church as the cause of its diminishment in terms of relevance and membership, as a threat to its own existence. Mm. This was the Holy Spirit journey I had to take. Um, I had a sabbatical coming up, and I thought, I'm leaving for three months. It was actually three and a half months. I'm leaving the institutional church. I'll come back. But I have to walk with the Holy Spirit through what's happening outside of our box mm -hmm. and ask myself if what's coming is of the Holy Spirit. And if it is, I'll go back to the institution and spend the rest of my life helping them understand that what's coming is not a threat to them, but it's the next breathing, viable life giving articulation of the church and that we should be partnering with them and the Holy Spirit in the birthing of this and stop presenting ourselves as the Holy Spirit's greatest impediment to what's coming. And that's exactly what happened. It's why the title of my second book is Beyond Resistance. It's a call to the institutional church to stop behaving as if what the Holy Spirit is giving birth to is something that we, on behalf of God, should resist. We should have learned that lesson in the last Reformation. We didn't. And so I wanted to become an agent to help the institution both transform and receive with joy what the Holy Spirit is doing. I knew when we put that task force together, if we populated it with what I refer to as digital immigrants, mm -hmm. then the vision would only extend as far as their lived experience would allow them to see. Mm -hmm. But there was an entire generation of people who had grown up in the midst of this birthing, and we needed to see the future through their eyes or whatever we were going to commit to on the other side of that would be a condensed version of what was possible. Wow. So what, what would you say? You, you took that, I think, invitation of the Holy Spirit and populated with us, but there's some local church <laughs> who's yeah. a little concerned about not having a digital immigrant, or there's a conference yeah. who's in a hiring process and they aren't quite sure if they shouldn't hire, quote, digital immigrants. <laughs> What might you say to the local church, to the conference um, that might expand or break open that box? Yeah. So I'll say the two things that I said to the United Church of Christ in Sedona, the Church of the Red Rocks, populated by 90 percent of their members are retirees. Right. Not exactly what you would call a congregation of digital natives. They're digital immigrants at best. And I went up and did this whole presentation on emergent church there. And they got so excited. And at the end of the presentation, their question was, how do we become this church 3.0 that you're describing? And I said, you don't. And if you try to, you'll kill your vital, healthy church, which we need. Mm. So the first thing I say to a church like that is, be the church that you are called to be and that fulfills the spiritual needs of those who call you their church and, and who, who bring their spiritual beings there for sustenance. And a church like that, that tries to become an emergent church, will kill itself. And there's no point in that whatsoever. 
But the second thing, and it's just as important, is begin to discern right now as stewards of the gift that God has entrusted to you, not just for the sake of your congregation, but for the sake of the mission for which you were birthed, begin to ask right now as stewards of those gifts, which of those gifts already belong to the church that's being birthed and enter into a partnership with them. Stop seeing them as your enemy and your threat and open up a partnership with them. You don't have to change what you're doing because it feeds you. And the awkward thing about these liminal times in between what has been and what will be is the feeling that I'm going to lose what I need for my spiritual journey in this time of transition. And it doesn't have to be that way. If we've learned anything from postmodern millennials is that we can live in a both and world and not an either or world. And one of the, the, I think one of the detriments of enlightenment thinking was it lived in this dualistic either or world. Mm. It's either black or white, it's either good or evil. And millennials are teaching us and postmoderns are teaching us we live in a both and world. And so once you make that move, then what's coming is much less of a threat to you because it's not an either, it's not a zero sum game. Yes. I, I, I resonate <laughs> with that. Um, in, in so many world, in so many ways, I think it, it isn't that the coming has to eclipse or kill or throw away what has been and what has been can inform so much of what's yes. coming in a, in a beautiful way. That's exactly right. Um, I think I've heard you articulate that in many ways. I want to I want to ask you about something else I've heard you articulate that I would love for the people watching to hear you expand on. You've often said, and I want to get the quote right: "The Holy Spirit envis envisions a future in which you matter." You got it right. Spirit envisions a future in which. See, I listen. I, I do. <laughs> Talk to us about that. The Holy yeah. Spirit. Envisioning and envisioning the future where we matter. So I'll tell you, there's a backstory to that. Um, in once I opened myself up to this part of my journey, this this office, um, before I was even interviewed as a candidate. I, I took a journey and I made some promises to myself that if I couldn't clarify some things in terms of, of mission and call, then I wouldn't say yes to the invitation. Uh, and my first step towards this was an uncertain and less than fully committed one. And one of the things that I did was spend time with um, a mentor um, who is a genius at crafting message and taking you on a journey to articulate what it is you feel called unto. Um, and I spent a full day with him and he walked me through some paces and had me write things and evaluate things and listen to things. And at one point he wanted me to encapsulate my entire vision and mission in as brief a sentence as possible. And I remember writing on the page, the Holy Spirit envisions a future in which you matter. And the moment I wrote them, two things happened. One is I said, I found my pathway to a fully committed yes. Mm. I, I can do this and I wanna spend my life doing this. The second was, and, and I hope this doesn't come across as arrogant, but the moment I wrote that, I said, I'm gonna be the next general minister and president because this is not my message. This was the message the Holy Spirit needs the church to hear right now. And at the heart of it is a message to a church that for at least three decades has been rehearsing to itself narratives of decline and diminishment and wondering if there is a future enterprise for the church, for the church, for the gospel. That's the question we were asking and imagining that if we continue to diminish, then will the gospel and its relevance disappear? And it was to that church that this message came. The Holy Spirit envisions a future in which you matter. What's happening 
even if it is a dying, and I don't think it is, it's a transformation, is a birthing of something new on the other side of this. And the Holy Spirit has always done this with us. Behold, I am about to do something new. Do you not perceive it? And it's not for the sake of something new. It's in response to a world that is constantly evolving. And if faith doesn't evolve with it, it becomes stale and irrelevant. And much of what we're hearing from postmoderns isn't that they aren't spiritual beings. It's that what they encounter in our sanctuaries has them feeling stale and irrelevant. And they want something more. And we can make that shift. The mission for which we were birthed matters as much in the postmodern world as it ever did in the Enlightenment world or as it did in the Reformation world or as it did in the medieval times or in any time that preceded it. And so that was that remains the core message that I have to the church. The Holy Spirit envisions a future in which you matter. Mm. John, in your personal relationship with God, um, in the midst of everything we're experiencing, what's stoking your fire with the divine right now? What's keeping that relationship vibrant and causing you to have revelations like, <laughs> like the Holy Spirit envisioning a future in which we matter? So if, uh, you know, to, to use an uh, oft used metaphor or cliche, are you a glass half empty or glass half full person. I have always been a glass half full person. I, I orient towards the positive. And so um, even through what has been a decades long now crisis of the church, I saw beauty in it. Even in this time of pandemic, what I see is the beauty of the human community forming itself in ways that respond with our better, better angels emerging among us. And in all of that, in every act of human kindness, in every act of human sacrifice, in every act of one person giving something up to make life better for another, I see the handiwork of God and it causes me to rejoice. And certainly there are days when I come to the end of the day, I just want to weep, overcome with sadness and grief and loss. But it, is, it has never been the case that I don't wake up to a new day, hopeful about what the future can mean and bring. And again, even through this time of pandemic, I am focusing my attention on what our chaplains are doing with such courage every day. I am focusing my attention on what um, elderly members of congregations with older pastors who'd never been on a Zoom call or a Facebook live streaming experience are doing every Sunday and finding meaning in it and noticing that they're getting more people showing up to their Facebook live stream than ever showed up in their sanctuary. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hearing over and over and over again, stories that move me to tears about acts of human kindness. And in all of that, I see the handiwork of God unfolding. And it brings me such joy and reminds me that a vow I made to commit my life in service to this God and her gospel was not a promise made in vain. Um, and while there have been prices to pay along the way, I wouldn't trade any of it because the gratification um, and the joy that I've experienced as a result of those commitments far outweighs whatever prices I've had to pay. Wow, thank you for that. Thank you for opening your life to that. I have a final question for you. Um, part of creating this series was that folks might be watching it and they're trying to make um, some form of meaning, meaning out of the current circumstances, meaning right. out of their life, uh, meaning out of the experiences that they've had. Um, what might you, what life wisdom might you yeah. offer? as people are trying to wrestle with those things, some in isolation, some tuning into a faith community or some not feeling like they're ready for that, what might you offer? Two things, no matter who you are sitting here listening to this, no matter what your life experiences have taught you, no matter what other people have said to or about you, believe this, you are the handiwork of a beloved creator 
who, when she fastened you, looked at you and said, you are beautiful and you are good and endowed you with gifts that only she could give and only wanted to give to you. That's the first thing. I want you to believe that. The second thing I want you to believe is that somewhere on this earth is another human being in need of those gifts. And whatever courage it's going to take for you to say yes to the offering of your gifts, muster that courage. And you will find more joy in knowing that your gift made a difference in somebody else's life than you have ever experienced anywhere else. Those are the two things that I would say. John, thank you so much for tonight. I know you can see all the comments, but people are commenting about how fruitful this has been for them and how they needed it in this moment. Um, and it's been a blessing to them. I want to do two final things with your time late on the East Coast for you. <laughs> I want to talk about uh, a way in which um, I think you're encouraging us, and it's the Shaping Our Future campaign that the United Church of Christ is doing. And if you're looking down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see this little note, join John in supporting the Shaping Our Future campaign. Will you just say a quick word about what Shaping Our Future campaign is? Sure. So um, the, the United Church of Christ is committed to building a future that the 40 and unders articulated for us. But we don't have all of the tools in the tool belt. And there were a few things that we said we would need in addition to the staff that we have and the resources that we have. We want to be able to identify critical entrepreneurial creative leaders and gift them with deeper preparation, skill sets, and education to be everything that God is calling them to be. That's part of shaping our future. We need to create and build a technological infrastructure that brings the United Church of Christ and its bold mission into the 21st century. And we really don't have that infrastructure. We're building it and we're getting there and we're adapting in ways that are important, but the Shaping Our Future funds will go to support that as well. Those are just a couple of the things that we're doing, shaping a future that brings the, the United Church of Christ into the 21st century. Thank you, John. Um, John, I end all of God talks with, of course, a thank you for you, but also a blessing. And I spent some time praying for you and thinking about you. And three things came in my own spiritual musings with the divine. And I hope that they are a blessing to you. There are three phrases that I hope you will take into your heart and in the rest of your ministry. The first one is Waymaker. Mm. I think you are called in this day, in this hour, to be a Waymaker, to make a way for those who felt that they don't have a place at the table, that they don't have voice. You will use your position and your privilege and what God has given you to make a way. The second word phrase I heard is bridge builder. Mm -hmm. May you build bridges, build bridges into dark places, bridges into the zones that say do not enter, bridges into spaces and situations that historically we've been told as the people we should not be there. May you make the bridge so that people might find their way. And then the last phrase that I heard today is path clearer. May you use the gift of the spirit to clear every path within your power. May your life be a testimony of a legacy of doing those things that we might know that you have not lived in vain, that your sacrifices have not been in vain, and that the ways and the commitments that you've made before God and before God's people might be manifest and that folks like me and other folks and who've been welcomed into this wonderful, extravagantly welcoming church might know that the Reverend John Dorhauer was a part of making that possible. So thank you, sir. I Love you very much. It's been a blessing. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you. And hopefully I will see you very soon in Cleveland. <laughs> I look so forward to our next meeting, Darrell. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Thank you.
Uh, we want to thank John Dorhauer, who did an excellent job. And I want to invite you all to join me next week for God Talks. We're going to be meeting with Aries Dial, um, who's going to be sharing a lot about her life and her journey and her walk with God. I ask you to please tell somebody about God Talks. I'll be posting a YouTube version of this time with John tomorrow so that you can share that and encourage some other people. I hope tonight has been a blessing to you and see you next Monday night.